case that you were making about humanitarian intervention by um, freeing the patents and allowing foreign governments to make the vaccine is particularly interesting in light of the fact that the U.S. was running a fake vaccination program in Pakistan to try to get information about Osama bin Laden, and it undermined real humanitarian efforts to give people medical care. And so you see that there are a few wings of U.S. imperialism. One is financial, one is military might, and the other is medical care. And it's coming to a head during the pandemic in a horrifying way because you you have a government that has systematically undermined the trust of its medical facilities and medical interventions domestically and abroad. And now is the moment when the United States could be poised to actually do good on a mass scale with the vast amounts of wealth and privilege and resources this country has. And even if it were to do that, it's hard to think that these other countries could trust those efforts after years and years and years of this uh, kind of brutal bait and switch campaigning and trickery. Um, and I wanted to talk about the ways in which the U.S. media rehabilitates this image. So one particular example, I think key example from this time is George Bush, who was rehabilitated in the eyes of the liberal establishment. He started from he started out as evil incarnate, um, rushing us into a war we had no business starting, into two wars we had no business starting. Then he was turned into a kind of bumbling oaf that ran interference for like Dick Cheney, who was the mastermind behind the scenes. And now he's become a sort of lovable folksy painter, friend of Michelle Obama. Um, we've seen the media talking about how Biden uh, botched the withdrawal and and they're saying that he can't recover from this and maybe this will be a turning point in public opinion. Um, it could crush the Democrats' uh, chances in later elections. But Bush has escaped, it seems, any kind of blame for his role in for his role as a war criminal. Can you talk about the way that the media um, sort of whitewashes its own recent history and also why? Why does it do that? Take Henry Kissinger, honored, one of the worst war criminals in modern history. Uh, it's hard to even uh, take, say, Cambodia. 1970, uh, Kissinger loyally followed his master, Richard Nixon, and transmitted orders of a kind that I don't think ever have appeared in the historical record. Orders to the American Air Force said, massive bombing campaign in Cambodia, anything that flies against anything that moves See if you can find an analog to that in the historical record among the Nazis, among anyone. Well, and it wasn't just words. It led to a horrendous bombing campaign, horrific bombing campaign, which turned the Khmer Rouge at the time had been a small guerrilla group, a couple thousand people. By the end of the bombing campaign, which devastated rural Cambodia. There were hundreds of thousands of enraged peasants. Well, then came ugly actions, which we can blame on them. Okay, but that's one Henry Kissinger. Go to India. Henry Kissinger supported the Pakistani destruction of East Bengal. Huge number of people killed, maybe a million or more. He threatened India with punishment if India dared to try to put an end to the huge slaughter. What were the reasons? Uh, he didn't want to under, he, he had a planned uh, photo op where he was going to secretly go to China and meet, you know, the 
smell and shake hands and it would be detente, it would be very exciting. And he had to go through Pakistan to get there. And all of this slaughter was undermining his photo op. Okay, so let's kill a million Bengalis. Huh? What about Chile? Kissinger was the point man pressing hard for the overthrow of the Allende government. Two tracks. One track was just straight and violence, you know, military coup. Then there was a soft track, make the economy scream, make it impossible for people to live. Okay. Well, they finally got what they wanted, instituted a vicious dictatorship, which incidentally was the first 9-11. What happened in 2001 was the second 9-11. The first one was much worse by any measure. We translate it to per capita terms, which is the right way. It would be as if on what we call 9-11, uh, 30,000 people had been killed outright. Uh, 500,000 had been tortured. Uh, the government was overthrown. A vicious dictatorship instituted. Uh, terror, torture, horrors, you know. Celebrated not only by the, by the United States, celebrated it, uh, poured funds in to help the new dictatorship. Uh, international agencies did the same. They'd been withholding funds from Allende, poured them in. The neoliberals, people who've been running the world for the last 40 years, loved it. They moved in to advise the government. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, the moral leader of neoliberalism, visited and said he was impressed by the freedom under Pinochet. He said he couldn't find a single person in Chile who thought, who didn't think there was more freedom under Pinochet dictatorship than under Allende. Somehow he couldn't hear the cries of anguish from the uh, torture chambers in the Via Grimaldi and others. Well, that's the reaction to the first 9-11. I'm sure there are jihadis who, are, who celebrated the second 9-11. We think they're terrible. We're much worse, you know. Take a look at ourselves. Is anybody going to talk about that on the anniversary of 9-11? Uh, maybe you will, I will, a handful of other people will be denounced, of course. But it's true. That was the first 9-11, much worse than what happened in September uh, 2001. Uh, okay, goes on. Uh, so if you want to know what we can do, we can begin by educating ourselves, by rising to some minimal moral level so we can pay attention to what we do and what we have done. Uh, just take this notion of forever wars that's being bandied about. Uh, Biden ended the forever wars. When did the forever wars start? Well, 1783. 1783, the British pulled out that freed the colonists from the yoke that the British had imposed. They had prevented the colonists from invading what was called Indian country, the Indian nations, to the west of the Appalachian Mountains. British had blocked that. Colonists weren't accepting that. Certainly not people like George Washington, major land speculator, wanted to go out and exterminate the Indians who we said were will disappear. They are like wolves. They will disappear like the wolves, you know, George Washington. Immediately, the colonists launched murderous, brutal wars against the Indian nations. Extermination, dispersal, uh, treaties broken. I mean, every horror you can think of. 
they knew what they were doing. Uh, the, the, the leading figure, the intellectual uh, architect of Manifest Destiny, John Quincy Adams, in his later years, he lamented what he called the fate of the hapless race of Native Americans who we are exterminating with such malicious atrocities. That was long after his own contributions, major contributions to the process. And that was before the worst of it. Then it went on to California, where it was truly genocidal. Well, we finally, uh, there's a famous diplomatic history of, you can buy a copy of it, a well-known diplomatic history of the United States by Thomas Bailey, who discusses this as, he says it was defensive. He said, after the colonists got their freedom, they turned to the task of, I'm quoting, felling trees and Indians and expanding to their natural borders. Meanwhile, picking up half of Mexico in the process, uh, robbing Hawaii uh, from its natives. That's forever wars. The United States has been at war practically every year since it was founded. Well, there were some victims. What about asking them about the costs? They have voices. Most of them were exterminated, but there's some who are left, and they left records. So we can ask about the forever wars. Uh, nobody's going to ask that, I don't think. It's the forever wars that cost us too much. So there's a, a good article in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, one of the lead articles, Main Establishment Journal. It's about, it's called something like, the cost of the Afghan war to the United States. Yes, it's a very serious cost, trillions of dollars to the United States. What about the people who we've been exterminating and attacking and destroying for 250 years, ever since the country was founded? Goes on. Uh, there's an article in the New York Times today by a nice person, Samuel Moyne, good, decent guy, about how the United States is turning to more humanitarian wars. He says they're still terrible, but they're more humanitarian than before. And he gives an example. George Bush, George the first Bush, the statesman Bush, his uh, first invasion of uh, Kuwait than Iraq, he says, much more humanitarian than earlier wars. Was it? I mean, American army sank to the level as the, the, the Iraqi army, of course, was totally overwhelmed by US force as they were repeating, retreating from Kuwait. The peasant conscripts, poor conscripts, Shiite, Kurdish conscripts who were conscripted by Saddam to fight the war, were trying to flee. But the American army was using bulldozers to shovel them into, dish, dishes, into ditches to suffocate them so they couldn't flee. And then, well, George Bush was orating about how uh, what we say goes, uh, his air force was destroying completely undefended infrastructure throughout Iraq, okay? This was incidentally a war also, which never had to be fought. There were plenty of options for diplomatic settlement. Press refused to report them. The US government just dismissed them. I uh, could tell you more details about this if there were time, but uh, could have been a war that was avoided. In fact, though this will outrage millions of people, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait was not all that different from the US invasion of Panama a couple of months earlier. Could go into the details. I've written about, I wrote about it at the time, I won't review it. Uh, gone, gone from history, nothing, you know. Uh, 
how about bringing it back to history? Uh, not the way the New York Times is now running articles about what they knew 20 years ago. At the time, okay, at the time they knew that, for example, that the leading figures in the anti-Taliban resist, Afghan resistance were denouncing the invasion because the U.S. Wants, wants to show its muscle and scare everyone and doesn't care about the Afghans. They knew it. Did you see it at the time? No. People who mentioned it were simply ridiculed and denounced. Unpatriotic, not good red-blooded Americans who line up to uh, crush everyone by force because that's our metier. Nothing changed. Going back to the first question, nothing's changed. Same institutions, same doctrines, same beliefs. Of course, the world is somewhat different. One difference is the population. There's something that Samuel Moyne didn't understand, probably doesn't understand, and didn't mention in his column this morning. He said there is a there is actually an effect of more humanitarian wars. It's not coming from the professors and the academics who he referred to, who somehow are writing articles saying we should be more humane. It's not coming from them. It's coming from people like you. It's coming from people on the ground. The country has become more civilized as a result of the activism of the 60s, the aftermath. Plenty of evidence from that. Doesn't get discussed. It's not the right story. So, for example, take take the Central American Wars. It was an astonishing, uh, horrible atrocities. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, torture, massacre, everything you can think of. But it was there were things the U.S. couldn't do. It could not do what John F. Kennedy could do in South Vietnam twenty years earlier. They tried, but they couldn't do it. Too much opposition here. Reagan, in fact, when he came into office, tried to duplicate what Kennedy had done in 20 years earlier. It was an immediate backlash from the population. We're not accepting that anymore. In fact, what happened in Central America was something totally new in the entire history of imperialism. Can't get reported, but it was very significant. It's the first time ever that people in the aggressor country didn't just protest, but went to live with the victims. Went to live with the victims to try to help them, try to give whatever assistance a white face might give, uh, and help them in projects. People from middle America, evangelical churches, all sorts of like, visited churches in rural America, where they knew more about Central America than the academics, because they were working there. And it's never happened. Nobody in France went to live in an Algerian village. Nobody in the United States went to live in a Vietnamese village. I mean, unheard of. Well, that happened in Central America. And that's the kind of thing that has changed what the U.S. government can do, not articles by academics in professional journals, but what's happening, what's been happening in activism on the ground, and that can make a difference now too. That's what changes the world. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.